I'm Chris Preston. And I'm Brad Zimmerman. And welcome to Street Check, the best two-person podcast in the history of Cabot Wealth Network, which has been uh, delivering investment advice for more than 50 years. Brad, good to be back. Uh, I was out last week. A uh, good podcast with you and Larry Chung. Uh, talked about Chinese stocks. And lo and behold, Chinese stocks are up, what, 6% since you talked about them? That is the opposite of what usually happens when we talk about when yeah. we're in a certain sector. Yeah, Larry is good enough to offset my counter indicator powers. Uh, Chinese Hang yeah, Seng's he up was the key. Yeah, six and a half percent since last week. Queb KWEB uh, is up five and seven tenths, something like that, since we talked about it. So certainly a good showing. Um, I am still broadly bullish on China going forward. I know Larry is as well. Uh, you just came back from vacation. Where'd you go? I went to Florida, uh, Del Rey. Um, we sort of our annual pilgrimage as a family down there. My grandmother has a place there. We did, you know, some uh, some time with the old folks. She's uh, she's 101 uh, and still wow. going strong. Yes, uh, and still very social. Uh, and then we did some stuff on our own too. Lots of uh, nature preserves and things like that. Uh, but mostly beach and full time. So yeah, it was a good good getaway. That's good Good timing. It's going to contribute well to our conversation in the back yes. half of this episode as well. Right. Um, so yeah, tell this, people what we're talking about. Yeah, this week we are going to go through our big three consumer confidence numbers coming in a little bit softer than expected. Rate cut projections, those are actually reversing a little bit and starting to see some expectations of cuts being back on the table despite the Fed meeting in the middle of the week. And we're going to talk about cannabis stocks, their uh, really, really big one-day rally, and then a little bit of give back there. Uh, after that, we're going to talk about summer stocks. So Chris and I have each identified three stocks. So we're going to have a grand total of six stocks that we like that are summer-related. In my case, nostalgia, things that remind me of summer that have sort of an interesting play. Uh, Chris's case, I don't know yet. We will find out. Yeah. But first... Uh, as always, we will be doing our Defend the Take segment. Chris is on the clock this week. Your take, when the 10-year yield dips below 4.5%, it is a green light for investors. You have 90 seconds. You may begin. Yeah, so we, we touched on this um, a little bit in recent weeks. You know, it's it's sort of a bond yield market right now. We're at the mercy, uh, you know, uh, above that, we're, it, we're at the mercy of what the Fed decides to do with interest rates, uh, they held firm again this week, and what happens with inflation? That's been stubbornly in the three and three, three, three to three and a half percent range. Um, but yields, the pattern has been when yields have gone down, especially when they've gone down below four and a half percent, stocks have gone up. Now we saw that uh, in well, starting in November. So. A year ago, or sorry, not a year ago, um, in October, when the market hit its lows, that was when bond yields got up about to about five percent for the first time in in, in decades. Um, and then uh, they started to dip uh, all the way down to below four percent, three point seven nine percent was the low at the end of December. Well, it's no coincidence that as rates plummeted uh, from five to below four percent, stocks were up big in November and December. They stayed pretty low, uh, below four and a half percent all the way until about April, early April. And what happened in April? Stocks had a big pullback. Uh, S and P was down, you know, four percent plus uh, last month. Uh, spiked as high as four point seven percent a week ago. But this has fallen 18 basis points this week, down right around that 4.5% level, 4.52%. And stocks have been up this week. If it falls below 4.5%, uh, I think we could see a, a real resumption of this rally. Um, it's a bond yield market. Bond yields below 4.5% have been bullish for stocks. That's the number to look for. That's the longest 90 seconds in history. Um, let you go a little bit long on that one to wrap up. Man, I the thought point. I was right on the post. Okay. Oh no, no, no! You you way overshot. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, like like you said, we've been bond yields have been sort of tugging stocks in up and down, and uh, 
I don't know. I think in the short term, obviously today we are bouncing back pretty strong on weaker jobs numbers uh, than expected. And weak, weak numbers is good for the market in this upside down. Yeah. For now. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> we'll have to get Gosh, it. Your market into that. pessimism is really becoming a problem. Ooh. Anyway, keep going. Oh, yeah. It's <laughs> going to be an extra big problem this week. Um, no. So, we, yeah. I mean, what are we at right now? The S and P's up a percent. Looks like it sort of hit its head on the the fifty day line overhead. So maybe some resistance there. Yeah. Maybe we get a short term bump. But certainly, if if it trades based on interest rates, um, I do think that there's still still upside ahead. Or the do you agree with the premise? Uh, maybe you know four and a half percent, maybe slightly arbitrary. But do you agree with the premise that? we're in a bond yield market and you know that's I, sort of the thing that's controlling um stock prices more than anything right now i i am of the opinion that we're in a, an irrational market at this point um the problem with irrational markets is they can last longer than you can remain solvent so you know when i give bearish talking points on stuff it's the context will be i don't know this could be 12 months down the road it could be 2 weeks down the road Right. Like there, there's sort of no telling. It's it's really tough to to pick a specific narrative. Um, but yeah, we, I mean, we have been driven by bond yields and by expectations for rate cuts for almost the entire year. Uh, yeah. You know, we went from expecting seven cuts to expecting maybe none now to expecting two or three. Um, and I, we'll get more into that when we talk about rate cuts. But let's let's talk. Let's start with the the state of the consumer because I think this is all sort of circling the same, the same theme for us. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, consumer confidence this week dipped to uh, I think twenty one month low uh, since since I think summer of twenty twenty two. It had been on the rise up through uh, March uh, for a few months dipped sharply in April. The, the biggest reason uh, people gave um, was just inflation, you know, the inflation sticking around, uh, you know, food and gas prices in particular, um, just sticking above that 3% threshold that it's been for a while. You know, people are, are feeling that and people are annoyed that uh, prices are remaining as high as they have been. Um, but you know, other concerns were cited too. Secondary, pretty distant secondary concerns uh, in the in the survey were you know all the ge geopolitical concerns going on right now between um, what's happening in Gaza, Russia, Ukraine, U.S. China tensions. Uh, you know, sort of remaining. Oh, that's probably lesser concern. Um, and you know, uh, presidential election uncertainty. I'm sure is a part of it. But the biggest one is is inflation. Um, how much of a concern is, is one month, this one month dip in consumer confidence in your mind? Uh, one data point does not a trend make yeah. would be like the big takeaway. Um, so the consumer, the conference board that, that runs the consumer confidence index pointed to, uh, reading at 97 down from yeah. a downward, downwardly revised 103. So it's, it's, it's sort of a data point and a half. Um, the expectations going forward were actually very bad. The short-term outlook for income, business, and labor market conditions came in at 66.4, which was down from a 74 last month. Expectation, and this is me quoting the conference board, expectation index readings below 80 often signal a forthcoming recession. Um, I will have plenty to say about that in the course of our conversation today. Um, but, you know, one data point is not a trend yet. So yeah, maybe people are, maybe people are just feeling the pinch. I mean, so McDonald's came out in reported earnings. They took, uh, I don't know, 7% haircut or something like that after their, um, no, maybe that number's wrong. I don't know. Ignore that number. But um, they they reported softer earnings than expected. Their CFO said they're in a, they're they're adopting a street fight mentality. 
McDonald's is is very consumer weakness resilient. Uh, people tend to trade down to McDonald's from other di uh, dining change dining yep. chains before they ultimately start eating at home more. So if they're saying they're taking a Street Fighter mindset into this, um, I think things are probably worse than better, right? I don't necessarily know that that indicates a that our one data point is going to be an outlier. Starbucks missed earnings on weaker spending. The the one or one wild card in here and is like I don't know how much of McDonald's sales are coming through app purchases, right? So maybe what they're seeing in softening sales is largely coming from people being tired of paying premiums to get stuff delivered to them, right? We could just see we could be seeing a reset of consumer behaviors from the pandemic era where you pay a premium because you're cash rich from pandemic stimulus checks uh, and you don't want to get off your butt and go drive to McDonald's yourself so you get a delivery, right? So maybe they're seeing a decline in sales from people that were still sort of clinging on to those behaviors. Maybe people are done eating at McDonald's. I mean, we saw Wendy's float the idea of like surge pricing. McDonald's has been rising, raising prices. A lot of this could be in response to inflation and some pricing efforts might reverse some of the trends. But, you know, you and I have been talking for a while about the consumer feeling maybe a little bit precarious, right? Credit card balances are high, debt balances are high, excess savings are getting sort of depleted. Um, and then a lot of this rally this year has has leveraged expected high performance from like AI companies and tech companies and has given maybe some of the consumers some of that narrative that the consumer is driving it a little bit of a breather. But I do... I do think that we're seeing sort of a meaningful full slowdown in, in consumption. And I, we have some other data points that we'll get to that are not painting as rosy of a picture as they did coming into the year. Yeah. I do think there's inflation fatigue uh, in general, and maybe that's finally catching up with, with people. Um, you know, I, I wonder how much just the down market uh, and the more bearish talk from the fed playing into like the, the, into that psyche, you know, the chicken or the egg kind of a thing. Um, cool. Cause April was sort of a bad month all around. Uh, but that leads to number two, speaking of, uh, of the fed and inflation um, stocks are up this week uh, because uh, while the fed again, held rates flat um, there's growing expectation. Um, I guess, a resumption in optimism uh, that the Fed may hike rates. Um, you know, people were saying prior to to uh, the last few days that the, the, the assumption was down to one rate cut uh, or forecast down to run one rate cut this year, uh, starting maybe in September. Well, um, thanks to what Powell said the other day and some data points have come in, you know, weaker job numbers today, which again, you know, that's good uh, for, for the um, prospect of, of cutting rates. Um, you know, GDP revised down to 1.6% or sorry, came in weaker than expected 1.6% um, uh, last week. Um, so right now the chance of uh, rate cuts, it has gone up to, the first rate cut going up to 47.7% um, in September being one rate cut. Some people say, some people are thinking that 19% uh, chance of up to two rate cuts by September. So bottom line, we're up to like, let's do some math here. 70% uh, almost uh, chance of at least one rate cut by September. December, year end, the majority opinion is that and this is uh, this is CME groups. Um, uh, Fed watch tool. Fed, Fed watch tool. Excuse me. Yeah, thank you. Um, Thirty-six percent think, and that's the majority um, think that there'll be two rate cuts by December. Some think more. You know, twenty percent, twenty-five percent think there'll be more than two rate cuts. I don't see that, but it seems like it's gone from people were resigning themselves to one rate cut uh, by year's end. And now it's gone. Two is the prevailing opinion. Uh, yeah. And that's even swung 
so we we typically have a free podcast conversation yeah. to to talk about what we cover. Um, yeah. You know, that was almost two hours ago. At that time, there was a forty percent chance of one rate cut or no rate cuts uh, by the December meeting. That's yeah. down to thirty eight and a half percent. So even intraday, these expectations are swinging. Uh, the majority is now expecting rate cuts, which is, you know, that is, that's data point number two for my things are probably not as great as they seem. Um, the Fed initiating rate cuts means a weaker economy. And that is typic typically what leads into a recession. So the, the Fed doesn't cut rates when the economy is flying and they're working on tamping down interest, uh, I'm sorry, inflation, they cut rates when they've done everything they can, but now we're seeing signs of economic weakness. Yep. And I, I think that's what we're starting to see here. Um, the rate cuts, this goes back to the you know irrationality of the market. The rate cut expectations are probably short-term and maybe even intermediate-term good, but long-term, um, they do point more towards that sort of the recession that everybody had gotten to the point that we assumed we were either missing. So the, the no landing scenario or uh, that the, the fed was going to come in for a soft landing. I, I think the odds of the soft landing are gone. Um, Why? The, so yield curve. So a weak consumer, right? McDonald's yield curve, is, curve failed a year ago, year and a half. Well, ago. The, it, that's the thing is the yield curve disinverts shortly before recessions hit. It's been inverted the whole time. And what ended up happening is uh, everybody essentially said, well, this time it's different. And anytime somebody says this time it's different, they're wrong. Um, it, it's never it's never this time it's different. It, so we, we've had an inverted yield curve for a year and a half. We're starting to see that actually disinvert when that disinverts that that typically precludes a recession by you know six months or so um, fed rate cuts back on the table typically precedes a recession the the other thing i'm looking for at is unemployment rate we saw that tick up higher to 3.9 percent back to the gig economy thing i i mean i don't know how accurate uh, unemployment is for capturing employment participation via contract work like if you're a gig worker how are you when you're responding to a survey are you considering yourself fully employed not employed etc a lot of the job growth we've had this year has been part-time so we've seen cuts in full-time growth in part-time and government hiring um my my big takeaway is that we are I think I said it earlier in the exuberant phase of the bull market right now. And that, you know, at some point the music stops, I think we hit a recession in the, I, like, I don't even want to put a time on it. I'll say in the next 18 months, but I don't know. It, it's going to depend on the fed. If the, if the market starts like really suffering and, uh, unemployment jumps to five and a half percent as as business hiring, like small business hiring, especially slows down. Maybe the Fed jams in four rate cuts this year. Maybe they do like a you know a double cut. Well, it, it wouldn't be four cuts, but like a, a full point of cuts. Something like that could accelerate fear in the market. For now, you're not going to call when a recession hits. People have been trying to do that for eighteen months. To your point, um, it's just very much on my radar. The the three things I'm looking at, unemployment rate, timing of Fed cuts, and yield cur curve disinversion. And until then, honor stops, you know, use limit orders, maybe under allocate to equities and over allocate to fixed income, something like the TLT right here. If we're approaching a period, mm, excuse me, if we're approaching a period where the Fed starts cutting rates, TLT starts looking really attractive, right? So you don't, you don't throw your entire portfolio into it you tactically allocate and you go from like a you know 10% to a 12 or 6% to an 8% allocation so uh, favor fixed income uh if you take profits on something maybe don't pile back into equities china i uh, i do think right like they're they have the disadvantage of having to sell a lot of goods to us so in a recessionary environment maybe they don't outperform so much as they or maybe they don't perform super well so much as they don't out they don't underperform us 
Um, I don't know. I, I'm I'm broadening my horizons, and I'm probably being less focused on U.S. equities right now. I do think that recession is back on the table. Yeah, it may be. Um, you know, we had, remember, first half of 2022, we did have two straight quarters of negative GDP growth, minus 1.6%, minus 0.6. But the, what is it, the the Illuminati board has to confirm it and say, yeah, it's a recession, which never happened. Uh, and then it did bounce. Yeah, exactly. Uh, 3%, 2.5%, um, highest 4.9% uh, third quarter of last year. Um you know, fourth quarter of last year was just revised down to 3.4%. Now we're down to 1.6%. First quarter of this year, projections are for 0.6% uh, growth in the current um, uh, second quarter. So, you know, it, it is trending downward for sure. Could we hit a recession? Maybe. I think if, it, if we do, it'll be a mild one, which was something that was people were all but resigned to. A year, year plus ago, like I, you know, I think we're maybe we'll just get a mild recession, and then it became no recession. So I think yeah, it was, I don't, I don't think, I don't think it's going to be two thousand eight out there all over again. Well, um, you know, that's that's a very good a very good point. Is that you know, it's not like we're seeing a a it's not like we're seeing negative GDP. We're seeing slowdowns in growth which look more stagnant than they look recessionary. I do think Powell came out and said, I don't see the stag or the flation in his press conference. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whatever timing, whatever happens with the market and the economy going forward, whatever the timing is on that, that will, I will say that will be his inflation is transitory for this part of the cycle is the I don't see the stag and I don't see the flation. Uh, if we see inflation keep coming in hot, we see unemployment start ticking up, that's going to be the sort of financial meme that inflation is transitory was last year is going to be the, I don't see the stag. I don't see the inflation. Um, I don't see what Powell is seeing. I, yeah. I think he's well, seeing stagnation for sure. It's shifting to the market. You talk about exuberance. We did just have a more than year long bear market in 2022, early 2023. Um, stocks are S and P is up about 7% since the start of 2022. Equal weight index and the Dow, um, equal weight index in particular is flat since the start of 2022. We talked about how that's more of a true gauge because of the, the sway that Magnificent Seven have on the S&P. Um, equal weight is more a true reflection of what's happening across all sectors. People have not been making money for almost two and a half years now. So I... I'm not seeing the exuberance. We just sat here a month ago, you know, with Mike, Michael Brosh came on and said, there's not really signs of market exuberance. And then we had an April, you know, pullback 5%, five percent, five and a half percent at one point. Uh, I think it was ended up being 4% in the S&P for the month. I'm not seeing the exuberance right now. Hey, well, threats I mean, of a recession, sure. Mild one, sure does seem to be trending towards that, but so, I'm not seeing the market exuberance. We're at all-time highs, right? Well, we're not. I, I, we're, we're off them, but we're, we're pretty much effectively at all-time highs. I mean, if you look at the S&P... That's the market's history is hitting all-time highs, all highs, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So S&P, we're at 5117 right now. We were at all-time highs on what? Uh the end of March. We hit a March 27th ish at 5250. We had a 5% pullback on the S P. We had a 10% pullback on some of the really growthy names. Um my, you know, my my fear, the problem with being uh being bearish on this is that it's easy to sort of skew catastrophic. Um, you know, the, the fear is that we effectively avoided a recession in 2020. And even with the bear market, which we've reversed in, you know, eight months, right, going back to October, we, we very much have been propped up by the public sort of footing the bill for all this, right? If you look at how much government debt is outstanding, the level of borrowing, the federal government spend has been really high. 
Um, and we've been propelled a lot by expectations for growth coming from AI when what we're we're not really seeing is a ton of growth in in the private sector. So like here here's I mean, here's the challenge though, is market can remain exuberant for a year, right? Like we could hit six thousand on the s and p five hundred. And then Fed starts engineering rate cuts and we get an economic slowdown. I don't see it happening. Um, if I'm just looking entirely just at like an S&P 500 chart, we're still bearish. 50-day uh, moving average is still overhead. Um, there's not a ton of directionality. Like we could open tomorrow above the 50-day and then resume this uptrend. I don't, I don't know. Um, it becomes very tough to trade in an environment like this because you can get a lot of volatility. I think we'll get a lot, I think we'll get more clarity with the CPI print next month. But I don't know. I mean, like I feel- the, Do you think the there'll be higher prices? Do you think the market will be higher by year's end than it is no. now? No, I don't. All right, we're gonna um, let's put the hottest hot sauce, so hot sauce bet on that right there. Madison, our producer, he, take note of this. So he, here's- S&P right now is 5115. I'm saying it'll be higher by years end. You're Let, saying I, I will say it. We will not eclipse the early year highs. So I I say for the time being that we're. I mean, right? Like I hate putting a specific number on it, but fifty that fifty two fifty level. I don't think we we eclipse that. Um, just the way that the technical setup is right now with the weakening economy, I, I can definitely be wrong on this. I probably will be. We could get a rally through October. Right, because we're pricing in the expectations for rate cuts without really looking at what the economic conditions look like. Um, the the other thing is this is a this a lot of the a lot of the the sort of hallmarks of this have been I'm doing fine, but the economy's bad. Right, everybody seems to be feeling pretty good, but there's a lot of negative sentiment about consumer spending and stuff. If um, I don't know. I like whatever. I'm a I'm a counter indicator. So if I say it's if we if I say we cap out at fifty two fifty, we go to six thousand, and everybody's happy and gets to call me an idiot. I'm fine with that outcome. Uh, I am just I am significantly less bullish than I was even even a month ago after GDP after unemployment and with hikes back or with rate cuts back on the table. Those three things in particular have have made me think that uh, the Fed is not. The Fed will not ultimately be our friends when the cuts come. All right, we'll see. Um, yeah, we're marking marking that down. Right, but here. I will say, even if we don't like run into a recession and the market flies higher, I still think TLT is a good a good target because it does not seem like we're gonna hit, we're gonna see higher rates at all. That looks to have bottomed. So even if I'm I'm wrong and we set new highs, I still think TLT is attractive. Okay, uh, let's move on to. Um, Cannabis, a, a familiar subject for us recently. Um, we've one of the reasons we talked about it. We've had Michael Brush, who runs our Cabot Cannabis Investor Advisory, on uh, a couple times. Is the prospect of rescheduling getting approved by the DEA, Drug Enforcement Administration? There was a report the other day that came out that the DEA was on the cusp of doing so. Um, as Michael had forecast, you know, he said, watch end of April could happen. Yeah. And there was a 50% spike. Um, sorry. That was in uh, the, the leveraged fund in MJ, which is the um, is sort of the, the proxy for cannabis stocks. There was a, let's see, it went from 3.8 to 4.8 in a matter of hours after this report came out since sunk back a bit, but it, bottom line, it's up uh, considerably uh, this week. Hasn't happened yet. So what do we make of all of this? Uh, it seems like it's about to finally happen, but it hasn't yet. Is that is that your read on what's happened? Is that the report was enough to send, you know, stocks sort of soaring briefly, but then the lack of actual of it actually happening happening is sort of just a little bit of cold water on the rally for now. Yeah, probably. I think cannabis is a sector that has burned a lot of people for a long time, right? It's down ninety percent from its all time highs in like no what, nineteen. Yeah. 
yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know. Sometimes unintended. Planned. Yeah. Um, so it's burned a lot of people. I could see a hesitancy in diving back into cannabis names. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's always like the buy the rumor, sell the news element of it. But unless you're hyper focused on cannabis stocks, you probably missed the news that some DEA, you know, insider or uh, official or whomever off, you know, like on background, they they said, OK, yeah, we're going to follow along with it. It's It would have been pretty easy news to miss and something that people might you might intentionally drag your feet a little bit diving back in and say, okay, well, I'm going to wait for an actual reversal to show up. Um, you know, like you said, it popped, uh, gave back some of those gains in a perfectly reasonable way has, and cannabis stocks in general have sort of set up at higher levels. That's, a, that's bullish. That's a good thing to happen. Um, and then I could certainly see cannabis stocks when we get like an official announcement, getting a subsequent rally. And then, if they uh, get up over that those intraday highs, that's probably a green light to not pile in, but yeah, start buying. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? How do you think they will react? Cannabis stocks will react once the news actually hits. Like, does that is that a game changer for cannabis stocks? Does that send them to sort of a another level, or or do you think it'll be a you know buy the rumor, sell the news kind of a thing? I don't know why there'd be a a sell-off after the thing that people have been waiting for actually happens. Given that cannabis stocks, while up, are still way below, way below their highs of what twenty eighteen. I'm just looking at the MJ, the ETF, peaked at forty in September twenty eighteen. It's at four now. Is rescheduling the thing? or I guess the first domino to fall that sends cannabis stocks back up to, you know, I don't think it's going to 40 overnight, but uh, back up to sort of, you know, uh, appealing levels for people where they really get people's attention. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I mean, it is hard to trust after this, this many years of, you know, Lucy pulling the football, Uh, but the, I mean, the, the upside with rescheduling is that, cannabis companies can change their accounting, right? It doesn't, right. if they reschedule it, there's not a bunch of like trigger laws that will legalize cannabis in all these states. It doesn't materially change the the decriminalization or legalization picture. I mean, it might signal that the administration, uh, the current administration is, is maybe on board with some sort of broad decriminalization that would legalize it across the country. And that, that, you know, doubles the cannabis market size overnight. The rescheduling doesn't do that. It it essentially allows ca- cannabis companies to take losses, so it improves their earnings profiles. I, I think something like that is probably pretty priced in. Um, yeah, it's certainly. I wonder not if the Safer news. Banking Act, which you know is is really totally stagnated, uh, making its way through Congress. I wonder if that's the bigger. Uh, potentially real world effect on cannabis stocks because that would uh, give uh, cannabis companies banking ac- access. The big, I think, the biggest thing with safe, safer banking is if it green lights more domestic investment, institutional level investment into cannabis names. That would be a, a big needle mover. But from like a day to day operational standpoint, all right, cannabis companies can operate a little bit more efficiency efficiently because they're not doing business in all cash. They don't necessarily have to hire as many security guards, right? They have better access to banking. They can take tax write-offs, but they're still selling the same number of units to the in the same legal areas until we have decriminalization or until we keep doing the sort of state-by-state domino move of gradual legalization spend, uh, spreading. Um, safer banking, if we start if it starts allowing some more institutional pension fund investment, retirement plan investment, stuff like that into cannabis names, I think is it would probably be a bigger needle mover from a share price standpoint. But um, yeah, I, I don't see anything bad. Yeah, I, I think I think it's safe to at least say cannabis stocks have probably bottomed. The, the, yeah. worst, the worst days are behind them. Uh, it, it took years of you know, of falling. Uh, I think th- there have been times in the last couple of years where people were like, all right, maybe it's fallen far enough. And it just it still had greater depths to plumb. Now there are tangible reasons for which there weren't uh, a year ago, um, other than just, you know, 
cannabis is getting more legalized. It's sort of just the general, the world is moving towards cannabis legalization. Now there's tangible things like rescheduling, possibly the Safer Banking Act, what Germany uh, just legalized it, things like that. Um, I, I think we can safely say that the worst is behind cannabis stocks. So, you know, you could do with that what, what you will. Um, I think it's a good time to buy them, especially after there's a big pullback. Cannabis stocks are up for the week, but if you, you know, if you bought at the end of the day, yeah. what, two days ago when the, when the rumor or the report came out that rescheduling was happening, uh, you'd be, you know, down in the last yeah. couple of days. But I think after this, pull, this pullback could be a, this dip could be a, a good one to buy if you're interested in, you know, to, taking a flyer on cannabis stocks. Yeah. And even if we don't get the confirmate, like official confirmation of rescheduling news, you're probably looking at something that just drifts, maybe drifts down a little bit while we keep waiting on, on good news to come out, but it doesn't, there's nothing about this short-term price movement that sort of makes cannabis stock that makes can, cannabis stocks a worse long-term holding or right. long-term investment. You just might not get as much short-term upside as you'd hope, but I do think it, it improves the outlook for long-term just yeah. because earnings are going to look a lot better from a lot of these companies with the IRS rule 280 E, I think, um, be no longer being applicable because it's being rescheduled and then they can take, they can start taking losses the, the same way that every other public company uh, uh, does their accounting. So earnings are going to look a lot better, more opportunity for upside beats and, and for valuing cannabis companies like you know, fundamental companies and not this sort of speculative asset class. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, there's been so much choppiness the last six months, you know, it'll be way up one day on certain rumor, usually around rescheduling, um, and then right back down. But it's been the classic, you know, what do we call it? A stair step uh, pattern. It's gone from uh, so it's, uh, it's up. Cannabis stocks are up going by the MJ again. 45% in the last six months. Um, I do you know, think my, it's not nothing. Yeah. And I think Michael has, has a, a smart way to trade it. Um, yeah. I'm not going to give away the secret sauce, but uh, it's, it's sort of tactical positioning around catalysts that mm -hmm. I, I think is a smart way to do it. Especially if, if the consensus is that things can't get, is that the bottom is in, I mean, I, me saying that on this podcast will cause cannabis stocks to crash, but it very much feels like the bottom is in for them and that yeah. gradually adding to a position and then playing them tactically is probably a smart way to go about it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't see any reason why the bottom wouldn't, wouldn't be in at this point, um, which is not something I could have said. Six months ago, six months ago. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's move on to our featured segment. Um, we promised uh, as, as Brad mentioned at the top uh, summer stocks, uh, you're going to do a, a fun, you know, it, take these with somewhat of a grain of salt because usually companies don't um, don't go up or down a ton due strictly to seasonality. Um, but these are just with summer upcoming. These are some stocks so we each pick three that we like uh, going forward, whether that's you know next uh, next few months or, or further out than that. Um, do you want to kick things off with your first pick? Yeah, I'm going to start with, I'm going to mix up, mix things up a little bit. Um, I'm going to go with a turnaround name. And part of my, part of my mentality with this was, all right, well, what's the stuff that I look back on fondly of my summers growing up, being a younger man, mm -hmm. you know, not having a family and kids and stuff like that. Um, camping, love camping, love mm -hmm. a summer camp out. Newell Rubbermaid manufactures Coleman products coleman coolers yep. they also make rubbermaid um they are in rough shape and they're actually in pretty rough shape at their late in their latest earnings calls they pointed out to their innovation in in sharpies and getting more people excited about using sharpies and like paper mate and gel pens they are also in the midst of a turnaround and are down 73 percent in the last three years they have five billion in debt outstanding um, they're trading, I, I think they're, their multiples, it's like five times revenues or something like that for their, their debt levels. Um, they're looking to cut that in half. 
they did get an analyst upgrade. They're currently trading around seven fifty a share. Uh, the latest analyst upgrades were pricing them around eight dollars a share. So this is one that is for your long term watch list. Um, What's the ticker uh, they, symbol again? Sorry, NWL is Newell Rubbermaid. This is one that, like, I would expect Bruce to pick, right? This ugly looking sort of turnaround story. The catalyst I would be look for, I would be looking for, would be maybe activist investing. They're paring down their brand profile. They're paring down their number of brands, their portfolio from eighty down to like their twenty highest performing brands. They are in mid turnaround mode right now. Yep. Uh, this is another one that sort of like cannabis is down a ton. Things look pretty bleak, but they're starting to look up. Um, I would put this one on the watch list and I would look for meaningful catalysts, especially something like activist investors coming in, institutions maybe taking a larger share, uh, profitable sales of some of their brand assets. They also make the Graco brand of baby products. So they have well-known brands uh, they've been getting hurt by currency lately. So if we do have a weakening economy in the U.S., maybe a little weakness in the dollar, that will actually help their profitability. So I think they have a lot of things that are potentially setting it up as a turnaround play. Um, but it's not one to, exp I mean, you're going to get, what, 3% returns. They cut their dividend. They're still paying one, but they could cut it further. This would be one to look for signs that they're making meaningful improvements to their fundamentals. Yeah, I like that pick. Uh, it's that's an upset that the um, the camping recommendation came from the Arizona guy, not the Vermont guy. Uh, but <laughs> I, I don't have one. Um, yeah, uh, camping's a big part. It's funny. Uh, I think camping's maybe a bigger part of my adult life now that I have kids than it was uh, growing up. Um, yeah, we usually do one or two camping trips every uh, every summer. Um, okay, I'll get to my first one. Uh, total the opposite of camping uh, it's not a, it's not even outdoors um movies movies are making a comeback have made a comeback the last couple of years you know pandemic here's some here's some wild numbers for you um okay so 2019 um box office numbers the u.s this is just u.s domestically uh record 11 and a half 11.4 billion dollars 2019 what do you think it dipped to in 2020 what it was you said it was 11.4 11, billion 11.4 11. yeah 2020 2.1 billion exactly right wow did you look at this i did uh, not look at that wow uh yeah 2.1 billion uh now what do you think it's up to what last year what do you think it was back up to <sighs> not a record i'll i'll, I'll tell you that okay. not, not up to 9.7 it's a slightly less than that 8.9 billion okay um that was up 21 percent from the year before but obviously you know quadruple 2020 so we're not back to pre-pandemic levels yet maybe we'll never quite get there um but it's you know it it's it's growing and it's back and people i think the rumors of uh people going to the movies you know movie theaters demise you know, I, I still wouldn't buy AMC stock, uh, but yeah. movies and movie theaters demise are, were, were greatly exaggerated, I think, um, as we saw by the Barbenheimer craze last year, Bar you know, Barbie uh, internationally did like $1.4 billion. Yeah. Uh, Oppenheimer, I think was around a billion, uh, close to that. Um, we just saw Dune 2 is up to 700 million. Uh, and that's, you know, that was released this year. Um, that's worldwide. Um, and there's a lot of big, you know, other big movies coming out. Like the Fall Guy comes out today. Uh, it's a Universal Studios movie with, you know, uh, Ryan Gosling, who's now, you know, a box office uh, magic, apparently, uh, after coming off of the, the Barbie phenomenon. Um, the Harrison Ford of our generation, I heard him called. And I think that was spot on. That's Love pretty spot on. Ryan Gosling. That's, that's pretty spot on. Um, yeah, he has a very high approval rating. Did you see the Beavis and Butthead sketch he did in SNL? It went went viral. Oh, I look it up. Uh, he wasn't the star of it, but he was part of it. He was Beavis. Uh, it's hilarious. Um, okay. Uh, so my pick is, um, this is a hiding in plain sight one, Disney. They have, um, now movie studio is only part of, movie release is only part of this. So they have Deadpool and Wolverine. It's the latest in the 
I guess both Deadpool and Wolverine series uh, coming out in July. Uh, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, um, which is a mouthful. Uh, that comes out a week from today. Uh, and Inside Out 2. Have you ever see in, you, you see Inside Out with your kids? That's really yeah. good. Uh, Pixar, I think. Um, yes, yeah, I saw that one. Inside Out 2. My kids are super excited about that. That comes out uh, sometime this summer. Anyway, uh, and you combine that with people going to Disney parks in the summer, but then you just look at the stock. It's got some momentum uh, this year, uh, 25%. And yet at 113 a share, uh, it's well below 2021 highs of 197 per share. Disney still has problems. Um, you know, it's, it's TV properties, ESPN in particular, ABC are just a huge albatross. Um, but, you know, I, I like the value. It, it's 25, 24 times earnings, so it's not a pure value stock here. But I, I like its chances uh, going forward. And, you know, maybe the the return to um, movie theaters will help um, sort of a dig out of the hole it dug for it, itself or claw, claw out of the hole it's dug for itself. Plus, you know, return to, to parks um, in the post-COVID era, sort of a double whammy there. Um, I like Disney. Give me Disney. Yeah, I like it. I'm a big fan of brand endurance and Disney exactly. is iconic. Um, I mean, it's like one of those things that like, every, everybody in the planet can identify Mickey Mouse, right? Like betting on the house of the mouse is not a bad idea. Yeah. Um, What's your number two? My number two, Atlanta Braves holdings. Ooh. So baseball, summertime baseball. This is uh, from you working concessions in spring training. I think. I think you're. I think you got baseball maybe. built. Maybe the. So here, here's my big thinking with this. Um, earnings. Who knows? Valuation. Uh, They're Braves a really good team right now. That that helps. The the big thing is rich guys get richer, right? Every time we see a new team get sold in any of the major professional leagues. It sets a new record or it exceeds the valuation that you expect. Um, there's a lot of billionaires out there. There's only, you know, 90-ish high-profile professional sports teams. Um, if you're worth $20 billion or $40 billion and you bought the Braves for $2 billion, you're not mm -hmm. going to sell them for $1.5. It's not like a cash crunch is a problem. You're gonna wait till you're you're done, and you've got people lining up outside your door to pay two point seven for them. Um, so who owns this them would, now? Is it not? It's not Ted it's, Turner anymore, is it? Was Liber is it? Me, Liberty Media and uh, is the is the largest holder of yeah. the Braves. Um, they have a lease. So the the Braves holding company owns the Braves team and Battery Atlanta Park, which is their mixed use retail development around the the truest park stadium they have a lease there so like retail property is bad right now and it's potentially going to get worse but they've got a lease through 2046 with a potential expansion through 2051 this is one that you just park it in your account for the next 20 years yeah. and you're like oh this is up 190 percent yeah i'm averaging a 15 percent return on the, like whatever the the numbers actually turn into but this feels like one that you just park in, in in your back pocket and you never look at and you don't worry about earnings because as long as the economy works rich people are going to continue getting richer uh they will continue to buy professional sports teams yep. and absent right like some sort of major catastrophe for a league or something like that they're not suddenly going to lose value it's also the only thing that continues to draw live viewers so yeah. which is which is live sports um so it's really important for media yeah. buy batra sit in your put it in your back pocket for the next 20 years yeah baseball i think is on the cusp of a deal with i think it's apple to have um uh, sort of like premier league soccer to have morning baseball on sundays uh it's different because <laughs> the time they'd actually be playing in the morning <laughs> as opposed to just us watching it in the morning here uh you know, night games in, in, uh, in London or whatever, but, um, yeah, I mean, sports franchises increase over time unless their leagues implode. And I don't think that's going to happen with major league baseball. Um, do you ever, do you, do you remember that Braves games used to air on was it TBS, TBS, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, before we used before, to have, that used to be a thing where there are a couple teams that were nationally televised. The Cubs too, I think WGN. Yeah, uh, before, but Braves games were like every night. That's what TBS had. Yeah, before we before the Diamondbacks were in Phoenix, we didn't have a sports. Arizona did not have a professional baseball team, so your your options were watch the Cubs or watch the Braves. Yeah, and that's why there's so many Braves and probably Cubs fans out there because. Those were their team. Those are the only teams you could watch, you know, in, in our childhoods. Yeah, I have uh, a Cubs souvenir section from the Daily Herald in Chicago, 1984 National League East champion uh, mounted on my wall. My whole family was originally from Chicago. I still have family out there. I am going to be going there this summer as a Cubs fan. Spring training Cubs. Bra- hated the Braves. Cubs fan, though. Yeah. Cubs should go public, too. More teams should do this. Um, okay, good pick. Um, my next one is more general. I, I, I'm sort of skirting the rules a little bit here. It's not a stock specific, but um, energy in general, XLF. Uh, uh, sure aside, in the summer is gas prices going up. Now they've, they've come back a little bit recently from, I think they got up to close to $90 a barrel, maybe above that. And now it's 80, 87 ish. I think it depends okay. on if you're looking at Brent or West Texas, but yeah. Yeah. WTI, I think um, down back below 80 now. Uh, but the, you know, the general trend is that uh, gas prices go up in the summer, uh, you know, summer travel, uh, both airlines and people drive in places. Um, XLF is, you know, good, pro- good proxy. Or, or no, sorry, not XLF, XLE. XLF is the financial sector. Financials, yeah. XLE, um, you know, is it, a good proxy for the sector. Um, and I, I'm not a big energy stock guy, so that's why part of why I'm not choosing one in particular, and who knows no. from one to the other. Um, if, if you want to get into that nitty-gritty, we have several um, advisories w- uh, with Cabot that, do recommend uh, specific energy stocks, um, but sort of a, a catch-all is XLE, and this is you know not just limited to, to summer. I think all the geopolitical turmoil out, out there right now, um, oil prices is go could go skyrocketing at any moment, as they did after the um, the Russia Ukraine uh, war started. Uh, what is that? Two over two years ago now. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, that's sort of a classic, you know, summer play. Um, you know, it, it XLE just looking at the chart does tend to go up over the summer. Um, not always, but um, you know, we've talked about how travel is back, and I'm, I don't want to step on my my third pick, but um, that's part of this. Um, it, it, people are flying all over the the world again now post COVID and uh and traveling more in the summer and uh that's bullish for uh for oil companies guests and anything energy related so that's my pick yeah i i like the i like the rationale on it yeah uh what's your number three my last pick celsius energy right uh my can't go with so Piggybacking on the Braves, baseball, what's better at a baseball game or out camping than a beer? Well, uh, you and I were in here on, you know, some sometime around January end of last year saying, hey, we don't like beer stocks. Uh, mm-hmm. They're down about 7% since then. Sam Adams down double digit percent. Um, there are secular trends moving away from that. People are looking for a nice cold beverage over the summer. Celsius has a really good technical setup and a lot of momentum behind it. So if I am wrong, and we do set new prices, which we will probably do next week, because I am always wrong. Um, so I like Celsius for for a momentum pick. So when when the S and P breaks back up above its fifty day moving average, and we're breaking through old uh, old all time highs, we're stretching towards fifty four hundred on on the S and P. Uh, Celsius, I, I think, is going to look really good. Yeah, I like that pick, and that's that's been sort of a, a Cabot darling for. For a while, um, you keep mentioning the, you know, I'm always wrong. At what point do you embrace the Costanza, do the opposite? Um, it doesn't, so it doesn't work. Um, I was apparently in a last, in a past life, I was cursed to always know what's going to happen, but never be able to do anything about it. So I can't, pr- 
profit off of my ability to invert anything. Um, it's it's a genie's curse. I can't do anything about it. No, yeah. but <laughs> no. Uh, my the the lessons that I am taking away, in all seriousness, are things will be half as bad as I expect in twice as long. So no, we probably won't get a recession. What we will probably get is a correction over the next six months. We probably hit new all time highs. Maybe we go back to the 200 day and then the market rallies half as bad. It's going to take twice as long. I can't profit on it though. That's okay. Um, okay. Well, since we're, we're running pretty long, I'll, I'll quickly yeah. get to my third pick. Um, trip advisor, uh, trip is the, the ticker symbol that would fit into the, what was it we talked about? What's the, what, what's the name for the ticker symbol things you did you, uh, a few weeks ago, we talked about the study that oh, said the clever, clever, clever ticker symbols, something like, uh, that, yeah. like trip and, uh pizza like, there's pizza was one pizza. of them pizza uh, those tend to do better uh yes than just regular random ticker symbols uh trip well this is that's not the reason i'm uh i like trip uh trip is um you know trip advisor is a online travel sort of travel agency essentially um travel is up post covid um and that's been good for uh, TripAdvisor's stock and for the company, uh, it just hit. So they dipped all the way from a high of 1.6 by 1.61 uh, billion dollars in revenues in 2018 to 604 million uh, in 2020. Well, now it's up to last year hit new records 1.79 billion, uh, and it's set to. Uh, go up another 9% this year to 1.9 billion. Um, as people return to traveling normally, uh, business has been restored to TripAdvisor and other, other companies, but I like TripAdvisor um, because it's still fairly cheap. Um, you know, it's trading right now at $27. Uh, it peaked at $60 in uh, early 2021. Um, actually, excuse me, that was... That was the post-COVID peak. Uh, Pre-COVID, it peaked at 60, let's see, $64. No, excuse me. It, its peak was in 2014 at $110. Right now, it's at 25. Will it get back to $110? Maybe not. Um, but, uh, you know, I like I like the value here. Uh, and it's trending up. It's up, uh, let's see, 20% year to date. Um, even more than that in the last six months, 75% in the last six months. Uh, as we mentioned, you know, uh, travel is supposed to be up again th uh, this year. Um, and, you know, TripAdvisor, I think, is is a good way to play it. Yeah, I will. I'm looking at it. Sorry, I'm looking at Expedia, which is their closest um, yeah. competitor. They, Expedia just beat on earnings and revenue, but is lower today by 13 and a half percent on disappointing bookings. Yeah. Um, I wish I had more insight to add or had done a little bit of advanced research on that one, but just with that being a peer, that's something to be aware of. Uh, and I mean, we're in the midst of earnings season right now. I was looking at some also rands, uh, Dick sporting goods. Yep. Um, was one that I was looking at, but they've got earnings coming up. I think May 8th. It's like, man, I don't want to pick anything right before earnings because then that could totally reframe the narrative around it. And you could get bad surprises, things like that. Um, so that's just one, I think, for any of these, if they haven't reported earnings yet, sort of tread tread carefully. Yeah. But that uh, travel's been a priority, right? For the yeah. last two years, it's been like, hey, look, I'm going to cut costs elsewhere to right. get this travel that I was denied. So cut costs at McDonald's. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we'll, we'll travel, but we won't eat. We'll pack our lunches. Um, real quick, because uh, I know we've you know we've gone a little longer than usual. Yes. Madison Robertson, our, our producer, um, of all the summer stocks, summer activities we've mentioned, that maybe you haven't been paying attention, which is fair. Uh, no, what, I listen to every there, word you guys. Said. Okay, great. Uh, is there one that stood out to you that you had you nodding your head? Um, I actually just used TripAdvisor to plan our, we're going to Chattanooga really? for a couple of days in June. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, I've never well, used TripAdvisor. It's, it's ironic that I, that I yeah. pitched it. Um, 
TripAdvisor wow, and okay. Pinterest. It was a mix of the two. I also used Pinterest to help me choose okay. exactly where we're going. Did um, you was TripAdvisor helpful? Did you would you recommend it? I would. Um okay. I feel like people are very honest too with their reviews on there too, which is good. Um that's good. Or my thing and so we ended up um Picking, it helped us pick a really cool place. We're staying in an abandoned, not an abandoned, an old. Sounds great. Um, we're not <laughs> staying in an abandoned anything. We're staying in an old um, railroad station, an old train station. Where and is this? Like, where are you staying? In where? Chattanooga. Oh, in Chattanooga. Okay. Yeah, it's been nice. converted to a hotel. Obviously, we're not going to go stay in an abandoned train yeah, station um but then real quick the other one that stood out to me i don't think i told you this is I, my name is actually in some credits in a movie that's in the theaters right now um what? i did a yeah i did a stand-in gig uh, about a year ago just on the weekends bosses um and it's called someone like you um someone like you yeah and so it's a girly it's Paul Markey, neither one of you would enjoy it. Um, but I was the lead girl stand in. So Who's the lead girl? Um, her name's Sarah Fisher. Sarah Fisher. Okay. And this is going in uh, theaters? It is right now. It's in theaters now. Mm -hmm. So wow. I've been trying to get there. But the whole baby world doesn't really allow for many nights. I think movies. if your name appears in the credits, that's, you know, that's reason to you know, get get a babysitter one night and go, go see it. Exactly. Yeah. So that was always when you said that too. That's also on my summer one. Oh, that's very cool. That's really cool. I'm surprised that hadn't come up yet. Or, you know, you did that a year ago and I haven't even mentioned it. Or I haven't mentioned it. So you guys have too many important part. things to talk about. You're saving it for the podcast, uh, which is yeah. which we appreciate. Um, well, uh, we, uh, I think we've, uh, Yammered on long enough, Brad. What yeah. do you think? Uh, <laughs> yeah, apologies to the listeners this week. We went a little long. Hey, it, it, you know, we we I was gone a week. We had a lot to catch up on. Um, so you know, no need to apologize. We'll apologize to no one. Uh, they, people want more of us. You should know that by now, right? Sure. They probably just want more of Madison, really. <laughs> before we had her on. Um, so it okay. came on to help the people. Exactly. Throw them something at the end of this uh, hour. Um, okay. Thanks for joining us. Uh, as always, like and subscribe on YouTube or Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And we will see you next week.